It's banging! Bang it, bang it, bang it! <laughs> banging! What's in that bag? <laughs> Kiwi! <laughs> Chewy, yummy bacon! <laughs> If you like what you see so far, hit that bell for more. You don't talk like that. I don't. Yes, we took a detour. You yeah. tell us where to go, we're going to go there. That's right. <laughs> we went to Bacon Street. And I am not kidding. If, if I ever bought a house on Bacon Street in Lockport, I would legitimately ask my wife if we could change our legal last name to Sizzle. Because to be Paul Sizzle on Bacon Street would just be too great. Paul Sizzle. That sounds... That's a not... That could be my hip hop name. That's a. That's. I was Paul gonna say that's a, that's a stage name. If I ever heard one. Paulie Sizzle. P Sizzle. P Sizzle. P Sizzle. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, we did have a little bit of a detour. <laughs> with his new single, Ranch Ain't Nothing to <laughs> With. <laughs> you know, I think it's an. I think we need to have an honest conversation about. Um, Let's say the Bills go six and ten again this year. Oh, okay. Vegas has us at six wins. We talked about can the Bills go over? Can the Bills win it all? I think we do have to talk about what happens to this organization and the personnel within if the Bills win six games again. Now, is there a silver lining to six wins? I mean, we are finding it this year, right? As Bills fans, we are absolutely looking at the silver lining of six wins. Oh, I've never seen more optimism out of a six-win team. I 100% agree with you. But it's – I keep bringing it back to the point, and you planted the seed about a month ago, and it's still there, and I still keep thinking about it. Okay, rosters are at 90, so you can't really tell. OTAs, okay. You're throwing you, – okay, you're looking really good. Allen's looking really good. And they that goes for all the 32 teams with the quarterback. Oh, you're throwing on air. Right. You should complete every pass. Right. That's not a. It's not a mystery. Um, oh my God, he looks phenomenal. Well, there's no rush. Uh -huh. Whatever. I don't know all that stuff. The point I'm trying to get to is, were the players that were on this team last year, that were good enough for a six and ten team, going to be good enough for a playoff team? Right. So. Yeah. We talked about maybe fan favorites that would get cut or this, this and that, and the other thing. And because it's in, the, it's in the third year of McDermott's tenure, we're starting to see the kind of direction they want to go in. You right. don't know where the offense is going, but the kind of direction the defense is going and how they want to build this team moving forward. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's fascinating because you don't know who's going to stay, who's going to get cut, what's going to happen. And because of that, how could you gauge how many wins a team might have? Right. The ultimate mystery of this offense is what put the team – because Vegas was like, we don't. They had six wins last year. Put them at six again because yeah. we have no idea with right. this offense. It creates an interesting wrinkle once you start to peel back the layers of what if this doesn't go well. Yes. You know, it's like we just saw the GM from the Texans just one year done, right gone. The GM was he with Buffalo? He was with Buffalo. I think he was previously That's crazy. in a previous life. Yes. <laughs> um, well, now, <laughs> now it's a previous life. Um, in McCagnan in New York, one yeah. year, done, right? And you look at if this is being shot, right? I don't, I don't think anything will tell us more about the patience that the Pagulas have with the GM than the Sabers, right? Ooh. If that doesn't teach you what their patience or tolerance is for terrible, then I don't know what will. Mm. So if we're putting everything in the scope, and I know the NHL and the NFL are not truly equal, but if we're looking at everything from the scope of what we know from the Sabers, and their issues at GM, what can we translate to the Bills and say, okay, if this doesn't go well, where are we this time next season? Mm. I don't know, because it's so fascinating to see how the carousel of GMs and head coaches have been over the past five years. Mm. The numbers of GMs and or head coaches that have been replaced over the past five years. Yeah. We had an episode last year going into the draft saying how unpredictable the draft was going to mm -hmm. be because you had eight new head coaches slash GMs. Right. This year you had seven. Yep. 
Yeah. Half the league is in their first or second year mm-hmm. of their building process. Right. Which allows for a lot of unknowns yep. that go on with the teams. Well, it's, it, it, to, be a head, to be a head coach or a GM, it's exceptionally sink or swim. Either you are successful right away or you are not. And you go. Yeah. You know? So the days of having a, a GM for 20 years, I mean, those are quickly that and qu- very quickly disappearing. Well, you have two figureheads of the team, one being the head coach that, or one being the GM that has to get the players, has to get the studs, and that's how he's going to be remembered, how you get the studs. Right. The head coach is responsible for getting coaches to, to mold these studs. Right. So... As far as that goes, it's like being co CEO. It's like a CEO and a COO mm-hmm. of a team. Because as far as the head coach goes, I'm not saying McDermott doesn't coach. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that he has to equip his players with the best coaches because mm-hmm. he can't see everything. Right. He can't be in a hundred places. He's, at once. he's he's a press secretary. Right. Every time I get, I'm, I'm at work, I get a notification on my phone from the Bills app saying McDermott's live at a... Co- I, he would rather be doing something else. Oh, I'm sure. He'd rather be coaching up this guy or talk sure. to this guy or do this or be in this meeting or whatever. Be at home. Mm-hmm. Any of those things. Rather than sitting with the media for however long he's got to talk to the media. Well, I think it's also important to remember that the GM to head coach relationship, they have to be in lockstep with each other. And because and the of moment the experience. That, right. And the moment that they're not in lockstep, you end up with what you had in New York. You end up with, you know, obviously what what's happening down in Houston. You end up with these issues. <laughs> in Arizona, that's another good example, right? <laughs> Your GM and your head coach have to be on the same page. They can't have competing priorities. We've seen this organization with head coaches that had competing priorities. Uh, mm. Majority of the Doug Whaley era. Mm. You know, it's it's just, it's what happens. But then you look at, like, go ahead and tell me that Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett aren't in lockstep. They're not. You say they are? I think they, I think Garrett knows how to put forward a face to keep himself employed with Jerry. And he says, sure, whatever I, you want. Okay, all right. You I know misread, what I mean? I misread your lockstep. I'm thinking, because unfairly, I think Garrett allows Jerry to do whatever he wants. Yeah, I agree with that. Despite what he wants. Mm-hmm. And he's still got to go with it. Yep, and he just figures out a way to try and make it work. And he likes having a job down yep, in Dallas. That's it. But the very different situation from what's up, in, up here in Buffalo, where uh, Bean and McDermott are never saying opposite things. They don't rarely say much. They are very good at interview speak where they don't give you a lot. Well, right? Yeah. But they, yeah. they don't really contradict each other. You don't hear them battling in any way. They, um, give, you, they give you the old school prison treatment. They give you food, bread and water. Yeah. Here you go. That's it. <laughs> Keeps you alive. I'm just, here so I don't, give you I'm just here so I don't get fined. Yeah. Speaking of that, they, the, the score app, I don't know if you guys ever seen the score. I, I happen to, I love that app. It just, it's wonderful. It's so quick to use and everything. So we use, I use the score app. I, I, they have, uh, they'll sometimes, the, the people that work there will have rankings and they rank the top offensive line units. Obviously mm-hmm. the bills were, right, you know what the yeah, number right one? Yeah, right at the bottom. What's the number one unit they had on that I list? I assume Dallas. No. No? No, they were, they were top five. Okay. Dallas. Eagles. The Eagles were number one as far as offensive line units. Hard to argue with the, the studs they got on that five. But my, the other thing that they did was they, they ranked coaches, coaching staffs. Oh, okay. One of the top third ranked coaching staffs. They had them ranked. The Bills were 17th. Carolina was 16th in that list. And Do you know who, I mean, in the top five, they had Seattle. Yeah. Which goes to your point, Schneider and Carroll are in lockstep with each other, yeah. GM. But I, I think the best, the most, uh, the closest relationship of GM to head coach has probably got to be New England. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Touche. Which was number one. Right. They had, they, they, yeah. all they had was, because certain certain staff, they had head coach OCDC. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. When they went through some of the teams... As far as Arizona, they had Kingsbury and Wilk at uh, Wilkes. That was it. Mm. I think he's the defensive coordinator. Oh no, Joseph. Joe, sorry, Vance Joseph. Mm. They had because Wilkes just left there. Right. They had uh, Kingsbury and Joseph. That's it. Head coach DC because he's going to call Kingsbury's going to call the offense. Right. 
They had the same thing with uh, with Gase, but they had Gase with Dewell Log- Loggins. Do you know who their running back coach is? In no, York? I have no idea. Jim Bob Cooter. Oh, I love Jim Bob Cooter. But it's a good hire. One of the one of the it's top hire. one of the top play callers in the NFL right now is not calling plays. He's buried in New York. Are you serious right now? It's so weird. It's so weird. Um, but to get back to your point, they got to be on the same page with each other as far as this is my defense. This is the player I need for this defense. I need you to get him. Right. Well, as far as our cap numbers go, we can't get this player, but we can right. get this player. Yeah, well, let me get scouting on it. Let me see if I can find you 2.0. Yes. You know? like, yes. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I guess that kind of begs the question of, you know, again, I don't see, I don't think, I don't think McShawn, I let me rephrase this. I struggle to see a situation where Sean McDermott could survive three years of six and ten. Oh God, no! Even maybe though not two, maybe I mean there's a significant difference between what the Sabers have built and what the Bills have built because the Bills have reinvented the culture of one Bills drive, and those players really, really do love being there. I can't say that with the Sabers because the no. Sabers have oh just had a carousel of people in and out, um, but McDermott has come in and sort of reinvented. Uh, the definition of being a Buffalo Bill. So there's a lot of value to that, right? Mm-hmm. But how much value is there really if you're only winning six games a year? So you think McDermott ends up on the hot seat if he gets another six or sub-win season? Or is it Bean that's on the hot seat? Well, I, uh, here's, here's... Or is it both? I, I don't know. McDermott brought in Bean. Yes. So I don't know if he'll go in that direction but we both said initially and we we were the prisoners of the moment the minute they made the playoffs you immediately just tacked on two years to McDermott because he broke the drought yep even though there were players there before he got there Mm -hmm. you know like the Charlie Weiss effect yep they broke the drought they could have gone one and fifteen last year and there would be no hot seat concern no there wouldn't there wouldn't have been any hot seat I think what the pitch that both McDermott made and when Bean ended up getting there was like, listen, this is, for lack of a better term, they probably used it with him. This is probably where it originated. This is going to be a process. You know what? You guys have flipped coaches. You guys have flipped players. You guys have flipped schemes. You flipped philosophies over the past 17 years with no sustainability. You haven't given a coach enough time to build something that is sustainable. We have the blueprint in front of us that's going to say, listen, this will work. We've seen it. We've seen it here. We've seen it here. He comes from the Andy Reid tree. He had sustainability in Philadelphia. He went to Carolina. They were a roller coaster of mm-hmm. 11 and 5, 6 and 10. 11 yep. and 5, 6 and 10. Yep. We know the mistakes that we made in Carolina. We know the mis- we know the, p- the positive things that work from Philadelphia. We're going to combine those two schools of thought and move forward. And that's probably how they pitched it to Magola. But he said, listen, we need time. If we're going to... If we're going to trudge through a couple of 7-9, and 6-10 and 10 seasons, that's okay. The bigger picture here is that we're going to have sustainability after we get through that rough patch of a decade of dominance, competing for titles, drawing people here, drawing players here, making this small market maybe just a little bit bigger because mm-hmm. Pagula is going to be concerned with money. And that could have been the pitch. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not there. But... That's the only way I see him surviving a six and ten, seven and nine over the next yeah. two or three years. Yeah. Trust the process. Here's the thing, right? It's six and ten. It was a very promising six and ten because you had players that were producing that nobody had ever heard of. Mm-hmm. Right? So it was the bad news bears going out there and figuring it out. And there was a lot of hope in that because again, you see that word that we talk about all the time, that evil P word. You potential. hate it so much. I hate that word. Because so many people buy so high on potential. And while potential is something that is important to, you know, have scoped out for a player, it's not all their value. It's not their only value. You no. still have to play today. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's... I I understand where things are going, but if the Bills have a sub-win, sub-six-win season, um, I don't think McDermott and Bean are in any way concerned for their job yet because of the value that they've brought to redefining what it's like to be a bill 
And I really think that the Pakulas are sipping that Kool-Aid really hard. And it would take three, three losing seasons before they would even go to the table and say, this doesn't work. What you built is not working. You, you must change now or you must go now. So you need to choose which it will be because what you built doesn't work. And I'm almost curious if the fact that the new CBA is coming up, if that doesn't extend their life a little more. Because you're not going to want a new GM in on a new CBA. You're going to want somebody who's been there and seen a CBA roll through. Bean was an AGM at the time. You've seen, an, you've seen the CBA roll through. You understand what it's like to work in a front office when that happens. Let's not bring in somebody who this is newer for them as well. Let's, I mean, Bean's been in the front office for a long time. So there's a lot of value to be had. But if the Bills lose again, I still don't think McDermott and Bean are on the hot seat. That's a no. I think they got three more years. Three more years? I think if they have losing seasons over the next two, I want to okay. reform it. If they lose the season, that third year, yeah. Which would eventually be McDermott's fifth year. Yeah. He's gotta he's gotta you gotta make the playoffs or make a run. Right. 